presentation, Professor. Thank you, Mr. President. Professor. I would like to invite the second presenter. This is uh, Professor Rajiv So from Jaipur University, Japan, with the presentation. Um, I suppose that Professor Rajiv So. Yes, yes, I am on. Yes, thank you. Please um, have me uh, full to introduce you to our audience. Yes, the second speech is um, Professor Rajiv So. He will be presenting the paper entitled Repositioning Earthquake Risk Management, Higher Education and Research in the Global Risk lands Landscape. Professor Atipso is the professor in Graduate School of Media and Governance of Keio University, Japan. Distinguished Professor ATMR, Sinchuan University, China. He is also co-founder of the based social knowledge academy RIKA and chair of United Nations Science Technology Advisory Group for disaster risk reduction. This specialization is disaster risk governance, urban resilient climate change adaptation and emerging technologies in disaster and climate change. He is a recipient of Parasit Bartia Saman Award of 2020 in education sector from the President of India. He also received United Nations Sasakawa Award for Disaster Risk Reduction as a lifetime achievement and for his contribution to Global Disaster Resilient Initiative. Professor Rajiv So, you have about 25 minutes for your presentation, and now time is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Tegu. I hope you can see my screen and hope my voice is clear. It's not ready yet. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I also uh, enjoyed Professor Kiono's presentation, whom I know for many years. And um, But this particular presentation would be not that technical, but it is more on different governance, technology, and social issues related to this earthquake risk management. I purposefully put this word called repositioning earthquake risk management. When we started, at least I started my career in earthquake-related work 25 years back, lots of things have changed. Overall risk landscape has changed. Uh, so I would like to focus some of these particular issues and try to put a few context at the end that where possibly we should be bringing this earthquake risk management. All of us know that currently the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which was adopted in 2015 in Sendai in Japan. Uh, but if you look at a little bit on the context of the global risk reduction, it was actually initiated from this World Conference on Earthquake Engineering back in 1984, when that time uh, United States National Science Academy's uh, president, Frank Press, he pointed out that we need a decade, like 10 years of United Nations and global engagement for different types of uh, disaster related issues. But it was interesting, if you look at here, he talked about a decade of hazard reduction. This is the exact word he used, hazard reduction. But we all understand now that we don't reduce possibly the hazard. 
we reduce vulnerability, we reduce exposure, we reduce risk, and we enhance resilience. So I think from 30 years, I think our whole approach or concept of disaster management has changed quite strongly. And because of that particular uh, earthquake engineering uh, that uh, in 1984 resolution, then United Nations started the IDNDR, which was the international decade. That was the first global decade back in 1990. And then ISDR, International Strategy, and currently UNDRR, which is the United Nations Office for Risk Reduction. And science technology has always been a very strong part of this whole process. Uh, I am currently chairing uh, the Asia Pacific Science Technology Advisory Group, which covers all the Asia Pacific countries. Earlier, I was also the Global STAG, which is the Global Science Technology Advisory Group. And our role is more not to generate new science, but to advocate for science based decision making. So it is more like science and policy linkage science governance linkage and the most important is the science and action linkage 1995 many of you know the kobe earthquake or what we call the hansi nawaji earthquake there have been like this possibly this particular earthquake possibly changed not only just the earthquake risk reduction perspective but also the global disaster risk reduction perspective we started talking about the multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder approach in Japan, outside Japan. We started talking about self-help, mutual help, and public health. We know that the government will possibly make the building code. Government will possibly make some sort of policy. But it is possibly our responsibility to enhance that building code or even it is our responsibility collectively in the community to make preparedness for an earthquake or any other type of hazard. We also understood that the risk communication became very, very important. In Kobe, one of the key issues after the earthquake was this community radio. I know that in Indonesia, community radio is quite popular after Aceh tsunami, uh, after Yogyakarta earthquake, community radio plays a very, very important role. In Japan, after the East Japan earthquake and tsunami in uh, 2011, we also saw that all the local government, they actually started, we call the emergency radio, and then some of the emergency radio was turned into the community radio. So important thing is the local risk communication, local risk information. And we also heard the, or we saw this role of volunteer activity and the role of civil society. While in Japan, before Kobe, it was more a government-oriented approach for risk reduction. But I think Kobe earthquake gave us a very strong window of the civil society, which is the non-government organization, as an organization, as well as individuals, the volunteers, and this whole concept of volunteerism, we often say that Kobe is possibly disaster volunteerism year zero in Japan. There were informal volunteers everywhere. There were volunteers, water volunteers, this type of volunteers are there everywhere, but the formal volunteer scheme actually started very strongly after Kobe earthquake. My uh, beginning with the, uh, the the earthquake, actually, the earthquake-related projects, as I mentioned 25 years back, it was in uh, 1997, and I always uh, am very proud to tell that all my lessons started from Indonesia. It was from Bandung. I know that Pak Krishna Pivadi will be sp uh, speaking after me. So he was our key counterpart that time. And the lessons which we learned during this particular project called RADIUS, I think still it is very much applicable. And the relevance of this particular lessons become even more important in these days. A few points here. 
is that we started a scenario based approach we made a risk assessment yes the building damage and the lifeline damages and all those type of thing but how you translate those maps or numbers or figures into a narrative scenario because ultimately our target was to bring the earthquake risk issue to the people and make people aware and make them more prepared for risk reduction so we did assessment we did planning and certain part of the implementation but all was with a scenario based approach local government and local academic institutions and key stakeholders so etb was there bandung khotamadia the municipality was there the municipality's planning department was our main which is bapeda they were our main uh, counterpart and it was interesting that we wanted to bring the risk reduction into the planning process so it's not just the uh, public works it's not just the education it's not just the health because every department has a connotation for the risk reduction so we worked with the planning department actually to bring it uh, uh, incorporated into other departments one of the very important issue was <clears throat> this risk communication which is the role of journalist you know that we can always show this type of powerpoint but it really does not reach the people so we need a different language so there were um, the one journalist or a few journalists who actually were part of the team and they helped us in making or describing very simple way that what does this type of number or this type of uh, like we put the damage assessment of the buildings or lifelines what does it mean so that particular hazard assessment vulnerability assessment and linked it to the risk scenario so that risk scenario they actually wrote in a narrative way and that was possibly a very very important lessons and i think that still we need that type of approach even after 25 years of the radius project and another important initiative we did back in 2001 that was we called the jc which is global earthquake safety initiative radius was more one city more detail analysis but jc was more a quick analysis try to understand or try to motivate action so we had this balance between cost and accuracy of course it was a very low cost not that accurate information but our target was to generate risk reduction action and uh, so say for example what you were saying is the lethality potential for the buildings two different cities san salvador and delhi and san salvador one of the major risk uh, the risk equally comes from the building collapse landslide then emergency response problems and medical care problems but if you see in delhi most of the uh lethality or the casualty in the scenario talks about the building uh, collapse is one of the major challenge and then the fire so possibly the risk management approach will be different between san salvador and delhi and that was our purpose to identify specific risk reduction solutions from preparedness analysis we also did some work in the recovery process this is one of the major work we did uh, after an indian earthquake in 2001 and there we started giving uh, confidence to the people not on the building material but the building technology the rural housing we intentionally chose the rural housing four or five types one is the adobe which is the mud then the um, uh, bricks then the um, uh, stone and the concrete blocks and then we made the second table experiment try to give the confidence one was the uh, conventional construction another one retrofitted construction and try to give them some confidence that why this building collapsed and why it did not collapse and bring that process into the recovery so this owner driven recovery was very very uh, important into this whole process 
But after doing all this different work, this is an analysis of uh, school children in Japan, uh, school goers, mostly the high school uh, children actually, like, so the age group is 15 to 18. We try to do a survey about what hinders from the preparedness to action. We know that in most of the cases in Japan, if you go to the school, yes, there are earthquake drills, the students, the people, their parents, the teachers, they have awareness about the earthquake risk. But the point is to turn the risk into risk reduction action. There is a major gap. So which type of education actually help? So what we found is that, yes, school education is important, but which gives a risk knowledge. But I think this community and family education, that plays the most critical role for any specific action which needs to be taken. Now it, the question comes that how we enhance family education, how we enhance the community education. It's easy to say family, it's easy to say community, but in an urban area, people are all very busy in their own lifestyle. How do you do community education? So we went a little bit deeper to develop what we call this one, two, three of disaster education. One, two, three, one is like, you know, that when you talk about the disaster education, especially for earthquake, it is very much for the drill that we have an earthquake drill evacuation. And this is very common in Japan in most of the school. But what do you do between one drill and again, the next drill, which possibly will be done in the next year? We need some educational process, some new innovations, which can be all year through, because earthquake is not a seasonal disaster. It can happen anytime. So how we actually continuously do some disaster education, that is one year, two or two different stage, and three is for three different hazard with focus, typhoon, earthquake, and flood. And we had this particular tree, we call the KIDA, K-I-D-A, knowledge, K for knowledge, I for interest, D for desire, and A for action. Our target was to bring the students, the family, the community to make action, but action does not happen instantly. So we had, after lots of research, it was actually accumulated of maybe four or five years of very intensive research on disaster education in different parts of Asia, including Japan and many other uh, Asian countries, including Indonesia. And we found a few specific activities which gives you knowledge, a few specific activity which gives you interest. Then it generates a desire for you to learn more and then bringing them to action. So this was uh, a model which we developed. So those are the work which you are doing for earthquake risk reduction. Now let me give you a few contexts that how this whole concept of global risk is changing, changing very, very rapidly over a period of time. This is a report every year, the World Economic Forum uh, in Davos, in Switzerland, they published every year in January. They, it's called the Global Risk Outlook. 2020 means the analysis of the previous year. So if you see, maybe a little bit difficult for people to see on screen, that there are two specific type of risk. One is the top five in terms of likelihood, the top one, and lower one is the impact. The color coding is blue is the economic risk and the green ones are the environmental risk and then orange are the geopolitical, social and technological. What you are seeing here that in the recent past, in last possibly five, six years, this green boxes has increased. So whether it is disaster, climate change, extreme event, biodiversity losses, both in terms of likelihood and impacts have increased. But remember that this is the World Economic Forum report. Their main target initially was these blue ones, which are the economic risk. So what I'm trying to point out here that our risk landscapes are becoming more complex and we need to think about all different types of risk together. Excuse me. Yes. yes. Your time is three minutes left. Three minutes. Okay. Help your presentation. Sure. 
So in that case, uh, let me just summarize, try to summarize it more. So this is the global risk landscape part. Then this compound and cascading risk, which is like uh, earlier we had possibly one specific hazard, but what we have seen last year, last last year that we had a long term of this Corona COVID-19 within that an earthquake happens then possibly the response mechanism the evacuation the post disaster recovery has a very strong implication so we need to think about this type of complex risk scenarios we also have now quite a bit of new and emerging technologies nowadays we can use very easily the virtual reality or the vr for generating the earthquake simulation especially it can be a very good educational tool for the children to show that what is the importance of fixing up the furnitures which we call the non-structural damage we extensively use drones after the um, uh, earthquake to have a very quick uh, damage assessment so these are the new emerging technologies which is happening the private sector role has become extremely important in Japan, there is this Japan Bosai platform, which has all what you are seeing on the left hand side, which has different types of hazard, earthquake, then tsunami, landslide, cyclone, and if you click earthquake, it will bring you a lot of different types of technologies or solutions. So the private sectors have come, are coming out very strongly in providing lots of new technologies and new solutions in this. I will possibly not go here and my last slide would be, my last point would be the science entrepreneurship and incubation. Possibly what we need is again a very young generations and they are these young generations of these days. I'm sure that many of you are participating in this conference. I think they have a very good entrepreneur mindset. Earlier we wanted everyone who was studying earthquake are possibly either be a scientist or work for a private company or for the government. But now there are lots of young students, they are coming out with their own company, with their own innovations. And one of main interest area is that how we bring science technology into this entrepreneurship in the field of disaster risk reduction. So I think that's all from my side and uh, uh, this is not a technical presentation, as I mentioned earlier, but I thought that I will give you some of the glimpses of the current state of risk landscape globally and bring, bringing the science technology, its link to policy and its link to action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Thank you for applause to him. Okay. Okay, again, thank you very much, Professor So. Um, the committee would like to give uh, the certificate of appreciation. The committee, please. Committee, please the certificate of appreciation. Okay, yeah. Thank you again very much for uh, Professor So, and please give one more applause to him. Thank you very much. Okay, the next session, the third one will be presented for uh, I think Professor Krishna. Professor Krishna Pribati is now here, Professor Krishna, and please welcome from here. Okay. Okay, um, let me introduce you to the audience. The keynote speaker is Professor Krishna Surya Pribadi. The presentation title will be Identification of 
potential development of hazardous model as an earthquake disaster losses model for school buildings in Indonesia. Professor Krishna Soryanto Pribadi is a professor of management and construction engineering, Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Bandung Institute of Technology. He received Master of Science and PhD of Civil Engineering in 1982 and 1985 from the same university, uh, Institute National de Sciences, uh, Apicius, Lion, Filler, Bonnie, France. Professor Kisla Pribati is a researcher at the Center for Disaster Mitigation Research, ITP, and his research projects such as root causes analysis of incidents and accident infrastructure development project in Indonesia, impact of implementation of occupational health and safety management system, and in, on increasing competitiveness of construction companies. The development of the contractor's initial engagement model for quick and effective disaster emergency response in Indonesia have been completed. Professor Rajiv Show, Rajiv Sensei, how are you? Uh, mentioned or discussed in the earlier presentations of the importance of learning. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to discuss uh, several topics. First, uh, ideas or concepts of infrastructure, and second, uh, the set of regulations and process on Russian infrastructure in Indonesia. And uh, the third one is on learning from disaster, how we learn from disaster. And the fourth is an example of uh, learning from disaster that we implement in the case of Manuju earthquake in 2021 and 2022. And Concept, concept of how to embed the learning from disaster to infrastructure development planning to improve the infrastructure resilience, at least in Indonesian, Indonesian context. So, first one is on resilient infrastructure. First, uh, why we need resilient infrastructures? Because we understand that natural disasters is uh, more and more. We have an, an increasing trends of uh, disasters, and in terms of losses, damage and losses, uh, they are big. Total, total, total losses are increasing. For example, two billion dollar in the first six months of 2021. This is from uh, World Economic Forum study. I just captured this yeah, to show that uh, we are losing more and more due to natural disasters. Next, please. Yeah, uh, in terms of infrastructure, also for this is an example of a study from the uh, Cox AL in 2019. Yeah, uh, 
for transport infrastructure ya, it is between 3 to 20 billion US dollar the annual expected annual damage and it is about 1% of the GDP of uh, some countries I think including Indonesia and if we calculate it is the same order of magnitude as the national transport infrastructure budget so we invest and we lost we invest we lost because we don't uh, uh, embed the resiliency in the infrastructure we are we are uh, building so there is a need uh, there is a need of uh, more resilient infrastructure next please yeah this is the concept of uh, resilient system infrastructure is a system actually so as a system and if we talk about resilient infrastructure then we understand what is a resilient systems basically uh, system to any shop yeah, in the disruptive pace it to have a recovery phase if we have a restorative capability in terms of uh, adaptive uh, absorptive and adaptive so in during this disruptive phase it need to have a coping capacity so an infrastructure system i would like always to stress uh, infrastructure as system not only physical asset but all the attendants, the uh, institutions, the people, etc., organizations that uh, need to be considered as part of the system, and it should have the coping capacity and adaptive capacity to adapt to new situations quickly, and then to uh, recover quickly. And for example, in the in the course here. The uh, curve A is showing a system that is not resilient because when recover, it recover only to lower than initial system performance. The curve B show the uh, uh, re resilient system that recover back to the original system, but the best one is with the transformative capacity it recover to uh, become a better to have a better system performance yeah on the curve c yeah. next please so uh, infrastructure resilience uh, in terms of development pathway this is a uh, uh, study from un in 2021 when uh, infrastructure is uh, developed uh, and then the shock occurred, the uh, cluster occurred, and uh, the development drop. When it has the adaptive capacity, it will goes up to uh, better situations, what we call the build back better with the new development pathway. And it is based on reflective capacity. And the other course show the resistance capacity the lower uh, the performance goes down it's uh, the lower its resistance capacity so what I would like to talk later on is in this presentation is on the reflective capacity because learning is part of the learning uh, of the reflective capacity of uh, system of, or in this case the infrastructure resilience next please yes this is uh, uh, if we look at the resilience of infrastructure we must see infrastructure as a system so it's a system-wide approach we have the resilience of infrastructure assets the resilience of infrastructure services and also the users must also be resilient so for example when a network or root network collapse user should be able to find ways to contour the 
the disruptions and this is we call uh, users uh, resilience next please yeah so infrastructure system approach for and has resilience uh, three elements here the assets itself the physical component of the system uh, primary facilities and link between uh, the system so because the infrastructure is a system for example a hospital is connected to the road access is connected to the surface by water supply and electricity when an earthquake uh, occur and the hospital uh, survive not still intact but if the water supply system uh, provided the, by the water supply company is disrupted then the function of the hospital will be also disrupted so we need to understand also the link between the infrastructure is in particular if we have a critical infrastructures we have the knowledge that is uh, embedded between human resource which is required to analyze plan create operate and maintain the physical assets they have to be uh, to perform for the uh, enhanced resilience and the third one is the institutions organizations or agencies and we understand that that infrastructure is uh, public good infrastructure is public service so in many cases institutions involve public agencies although we have the ppp now involving agencies and then should work together to manage the synergies with different sectors next please uh, next is uh, just a review of the existing regulation and policies on resilient infrastructure. Actually, this is a study, a research, preparing this, this uh, presentations also. Uh, he is studying whether the regulations policy in Indonesia is already catering into the need of the resilient infrastructure and whether those policies are implemented to produce really resilient infrastructure and our first uh, uh, finding is that it is actually still far away from, from this yeah. next please these are the various law related to public infrastructures, buildings, and focusing on mitigations. Next, please. Uh, on disaster resilience infrastructures. Some, uh, I, I think this is interesting. The Coordinating Ministry for Maritime Affairs and Investment and uh, Coordinating Ministry of Economy start to be. Uh, 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 interested in uh, resilient system, resilient infrastructure. In Bahasa Indonesia, it is called tangguh, ketangguhan. So they start to be interested in regulations yeah, to promote the disaster resilience in our systems. And also, uh, some document related to sustainable cities and Next, please. But uh, we try to uh, recapitulate. We have too many regulations related to regu disaster. More than one thousand, and on post disaster, not 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 many. Twenty three rehabilitation and construction only thirty nine, and this is spread at the national level down to the. Uh, Province, provincial, and also uh, municipalities, yeah. and many of them are uh, <laughs> contradicting sometimes. Yeah. Next, please. Yeah. So, what is learning from disaster actually? Next, please. Yeah. Learning is a process that leads to change. Very important.
uh, keyword is actually we learn to improve our performance in terms of infrastructure system we learn from the failures of our infrastructure system to improve the future performance and learning is basically a cycle starting from generating knowledge applying knowledge if we organizations in indonesia public agencies start at least the first and the maybe the first one generating knowledge but no less on organizing knowledge and even much less on sharing the knowledge and the problem is what next after sharing is it uh, do we have resilient infrastructure if we share the knowledge no if it is not applied, not implemented, uh, the sharing will, uh, the lesson will not uh, uh, improve our system, our in, in infrastructure system. So very important to apply the the shared knowledge. Yeah, next. Now this is a uh, very maybe Pak Adang, uh, Prof Adang. Uh, this is very popular yeah failure is central to engineering every single calculation that an engineer makes is a failure calculation this is from petrosky so engineers always learn from failures they because success is not uh, not uh, providing us learning yeah the worst problem in leadership is basically early success if someone get on a very success in the in his uh, early life then uh, it will not uh, uh, further success so why we should learn from disaster this is a uh, the old actually 1991 uh, report from National Academy of Science on a safer future reducing the impact of natural disasters that lessons can be learned at all phases and uh, we need to gather all the information and in particular for its uh, occurrence or uh, disaster incident accident we need to get quickly knowledge. That's why myself, Pak Adang, Pak Wayan, remember when there is an earthquake somewhere, we try to get there as soon as possible to collect the information. Otherwise, the evidence would be lost because of the clean up and recovery. And also we need to focus on the complicated processes of recovery and reconstructions in the month and years following a disaster because people still suffer years, months, years after an uh, occurrence, a quick occurrence, for example, or flood occurrence. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, actually, learning also part of the disaster resilience, as uh, emphasized in the Hugo framework for actions. That disaster resilience is determined by the degree to which individual, community, and public and private organizations are capable of organizing themselves to learn from past disasters. And I, I think this is our problem actually in Indonesia that we are very weak in this regard yeah, to learn from past disasters yeah. so what do we learn for example from from this uh, disaster to our, to our roads for, for example what we learn because after several years we still have this occur again occur again yeah. next please uh, this is very interesting. The Great Earthquake, uh, Japan Earthquake, uh, importance of planning, resilience is strengthened when it is shared. And resilience, actually, the result of the learning from the Great is Japan Earthquake. Yeah. So, resilience is not a result but resilience is an iterative process we must continue 
interact and iterate yeah to uh, to preserve and improve the resilience of our infrastructures next yeah and learning from disaster is actually process basically uh, process uh, start from evaluating an incident and identify the lessons what are the strengths to be sustained and weaknesses to be corrected and uh, Uh, learning no change there is no learning and actually in the full cycle of disaster management learning should happen in all the stages yeah next please yeah <laughs> yeah i just get this please okay yeah this is the uh, scope of learning from disasters uh, with, uh, very wide uh, area to learn from yeah next please and this is a framework actually for learning what is important is we need to have learning culture there should be an enabling environment we need to have a governance for the learning itself engagement of the parties of the stakeholders and also we need tools for that yeah and all the things are implemented in a learning management cycle next please this is the process of learning and sharing yeah next please and this is an example that we we have uh, next please from mamuju earthquake we have fortunately or unfortunately in 2021 2022 so what we try to study is what we learn from the 2021 earthquake whether it is implemented and we uh, uh, need we want to find ex post earthquake 2022 next please so this these are learning in in emergency response phase we try to study what happened and what is uh, implemented during an evidence during the earthquake 2022 in next please uh, in emergency to recap and community lessons yeah lessons learned and facing disaster events for example the community is better prepared for the earthquake 2022 next please uh government effort also there were some learning yeah but I, i'm sorry i cannot uh, detail all of this to you but this these are uh, things that we we find out in mamunju next please uh, these are also for the emergency response and reporting on emergency response activity agency and implemented so in 2022 the government were more prepared they built the water supply system in the stadium which is the assigned or designed as uh, the evacuation shelter yeah. for buildings for example such a failure because of they do not uh, follow the standards and then in 2022 the ministry of public work tried to implement the standard the uh, ceiling not uh, observing the requirement for uh, earthquake resistant uh, ceiling structure yeah. so this is uh, also still there are still some uh, the problem is because of the uh, system procurement system yeah. next please 
is better than gable roof for example and school op uh, door opening outside uh, etc next please yeah, and this is for road network and uh, coordinations for the uh, heavy equipment for the equipment for uh, earth moving for cleaning the debris due to landslide because in Mamuju or we have we have many many landslides next please yeah this is this is what what we they learn yeah the Binamarga the public work learn they uh provide uh, better uh, larger uh, road embankment to road embankment and in 2022 less less uh, uh, road closure yeah. next please and uh, this is also for clear water sanitation sorry uh, the picture below is upside down actually this is in the evacuation centers permanent evacuation centers that, that is the stadium for stadiums next please yeah so what we propose is to embed learning from disaster to infrastructure development planning framework to improve infrastructure resilience this is what we propose as a concept actually next please yeah we have the national development planning framework this is according to the law number 35 of system and law number 17 2003 on finance who, who budget are uh, assigned in the annual plan, strategic plan, midterm plan, strategic plan, and sector work plan at the national and local sector. So, how to learning from disaster during this process? Uh, next, please. Uh, this is uh, just uh, an idea lesson from learning from disaster should be used as a way to in enhance the policy in both the the infrastructure uh, plan yeah so long term resilient infrastructure planning policy medium term resilient infrastructure planning policy and annual, annual which translate into the work plan yeah, program plan and that is implemented when we have a disaster it should we should learn from what happened what's work what didn't work and then uh, fit that to all of the plan improve the enhance all the plan i, I think that's all that i can say next please yeah this is a uh, uh, kind of within the uh, infrastructure development cycle we have to consider all these uh, elements of uh, uh, learning from disaster for improved infrastructure resilience uh, next yes this is conclusion i i don't say i need to uh say on the conclusions yes uh, thank you Mr. <laughs>